Okay, um, I want to start off by thanking all of you for, for coming out today. Um, this is in some ways kind of an esoteric topic, so um, I'm glad uh, for those of you who are here for purely intellectual reasons and even those of you who are here because you have to be. Uh, either way, uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you're, you're going to listen to uh, me blabber for a little while about this. Um, I suppose I should also start by saying actually that the Nemour has a special place in my heart. The first time I ever spoke at Sac State actually was at the Nemour Symposium many years ago, long before I actually worked here. Uh, so in many ways, this is sort of a touchstone. It feels like a kind of a homecoming for me uh, to, to, to return again uh, to the Nemour uh, and speak uh, on, on these exciting topics. So uh, I put together these posters, uh, and, and I, I got to say, I feel perhaps a little guilty because I, I, I tagged with these lines here, you know, can a human love a machine, and can a machine love a human? Um, I was hoping that that would be an, an attractive uh, uh, hook, and I actually do have a talk on those topics, and uh, I considered giving that one today, but I've already given that one here at Sac State. Actually, that was the talk that got me this job in the first place. And so it felt like I, I, I didn't want to uh, recycle the talk again. Um, so I wanted to give something a, a little fresher, a little more new. Uh, that talk you know, would have dovetailed well with Professor McCormick's material. Obviously, once you start talking about conscious AI, uh, it's not too hard to start wondering about whether or not AI can feel emotions and uh, how we should make sense of that. But that is definitely a long-term project. That's the kind of thing that, you know, if it happens, it's going to be happening probably several decades uh, out, if not centuries. Um, what I want to talk about today is much, much more short-term. In some ways, it's, it, it, we're talking about things that are already happening. Um, and then to the extent that we're, I'm going to be forecasting, I'm forecasting five, maybe 10 years into the future. So it's going to be uh, some reasonably sort of uh, cutting-edge material uh, that I'm taking a look at here. Uh, now, I suspect that most of you uh, coming into this room, even if you haven't seen any of the other talks in the symposium so far, have a pretty good grasp of what artificial intelligence is in the general sense. I mean, you might not know the technical details, but you've seen enough science fiction movies and so forth to have at least a broad idea of what it is they're, they're talking about. Uh, but I suspect that probably fewer of you have uh, had much exposure to the phrase artificial emotional intelligence. That one's probably a little bit more obscure. Um, so it sometimes goes by the name effective computing, but I'm going to stick with artificial emotional intelligence uh, uh, just for the sake of uh, consistency. And I want to give you guys sort of a rough definition of what it is that uh, uh, it, it, artificial emotional intelligence is. Briefly, artificial emotional intelligence uh, is the attempt to use computers to better understand, predict, and manipulate human emotions. So I, I, I hope that topic seems intriguing uh, as you sort of uh, start to imagine some of the places that my, my talk might go. Um, but I also hope you can recognize that this is a topic that's received far less popular attention than the sort of a more broad, generic artificial intelligence. And I want to sort of uh, try to, to bring you up to speed on the current state of the art. Uh, so uh, what is uh, uh, the, the current state of the art in artificial emotional intelligence? Um, I want to do my best to provide a sober, uh, even-handed, and fair assessment of this. So in short, the current state of the art for artificial emotional intelligence can be summed up, I think, with three basic points. First off, artificial emotional intelligence is dangerously sophisticated. It's coming for your children, and every one of you should run for your lives. Okay. So the fact that you have not actually run for your lives suggests that you have enough emotional intelligence to recognize hyperbole when you hear it. So um, if, uh, if you recognize that hyperbole, you also might be uh, uh, feeling a little bit of skepticism right now, um, maybe even a little bit of cynicism. Some of you in this room might be old enough to remember this fellow right here. Um, this is Clippy. Um, Clippy was uh, a, included in Microsoft Windows uh, 98 uh, uh, as a virtual assistant. Uh, and he was an early attempt at artificial emotional intelligence. The, the idea was that as human as beings using Windows would become frustrated with uh, their technology because they couldn't figure out how to make it do what they wanted to do. Clippy would pop up and help guide them through uh, whatever problems they were dealing with. Uh, you know, they tried to make him sort of you know, uh, appealing uh, and friendly. Um, but for the most part, it was a unmitigated disaster. Uh, end users absolutely hated Clippy. They found that he made problems worse. Rather than uh, uh, guiding them, uh, he ended up frustrating people uh, and got really, really aggravated. So a lot of you might be thinking with that in mind, should we really be afraid of Clippy 2.0? Uh, 
Um, and I think that's a fair sort of default stance to enter into this if you haven't really looked into the details terribly much. Um, but I want to suggest that if that's what you're thinking, you, you haven't really paid too much attention to how many turns of the screw we have gone through in the last 20 years since Clippy uh, uh, was first introduced to the world. So in order to try to, try to give you some perspective on that, I, I, I want to take a step back and talk uh, uh, a little for a brief while about what uh, emotional intelligence is in the general sense before going back and talking about how it relates to artificial intelligence. So uh, to do this, I think we, we have to sort of go, go way, way back uh, to, to ancient Greece. Um, because that's, I think, where the, the modern Western ver vision of the relationship between emotion and reason was probably set. Um, but the, the, the traditional picture about the relationship between reason and emotion I think is captured well with this picture here. Emotion and reason are antagonists. They pull in opposite directions. The heart wants one thing and the mind wants another. Uh, and this sort of antagonistic picture, like a lot of the other foundational ideas in Western thought, comes from Plato originally. Um, and uh, uh, it basically seems that uh, it stuck around because, frankly, no one's had the heart to tell Plato how wrong he was. So uh, on this story, uh, which again, I'm imagining is familiar to you, reason is rigid and ordered and disciplined and deliberate. It plans. Um, uh, and, and these are qualities that are emulatable by machines. And so th it's this kind of uh, a rational structure that allows for machine learning and artificial intelligence. By contrast, emotions are impulsive, they, uh, they're esoteric, they're erratic, they're unpredictable. Uh, they, they end up disrupting the best laid plans that, uh, that, that reason lays down. Uh, and these are the things which make it, uh, uh, which distinguish human beings from machines. So maybe human beings, or maybe machines can be rational, maybe they can even be conscious, but they, they, they really have nothing to do with the emotions because that's hu the, the, the human domain. Now, there's many, many problems with this tr classical picture, uh, and I, I can't list all of them, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention one which I'm not going to get into, but, but uh, I find interesting for other reasons, uh, and that's first off, neuroanatomically. Neuroanatomically, this idea that reason and emotion are hard and fastly divided is, is, is just uh, um, uh, not the case. Uh, the brain is not neatly subdivided into rational components and emotional components. The rational parts and the emotional parts bleed together, and they really make a hash out of our sort of traditional categories of reason and emotion. So, uh, so much so that some uh, scholars actually have proposed that it's simply a category mistake to speak of reason and emotion as if they are fundamentally distinct things, and instead we should reconsider the way we think about them to, uh, to, to be much more holistic and integrated to one another. Um, so I could say more about that, but that, that would, that would uh, be getting me off uh, topic. So I, instead, I want to sort of fo focus back on what's crucial for, for my, my, my talk today, um, and that is the conceptual confusion between the classic model about reason and emotion. Um, uh, and to drive that point home, I want, to, I want you, if you, if you forget everything else that I, that I say about emotional intelligence, what I want you to remember is this. Emotions have a structure to them. And by that I mean that uh, there are recognizable patterns that elicit, exacerbate, mitigate, and dispel emotions. And those patterns can be tracked in rationally predictable ways. And on a moment's reflection, you can see why this is. If, if, if emotions really were completely unpredictable, then that would make social life much, much more chaotic for us. The, the reason why we can navigate other human beings at least reasonably well is because we are at least decent at understanding their emotions, of knowing what will upset another person, of knowing how to calm another person down. And of course, it's not just about other people, it's also about ourselves understanding our own emotions and predicting our own emotions. Without this rational structure in place of the emotions, none of that would be the case. Now, one of the, uh, uh, the, the fascinating things about the way emotions work is that it's not just an internal storm that's somehow isolated and private to each individual. There are outward displays of emotions, most specifically in uh, facial expressions and in body language. Um, and there's a fair amount of uh, conformity across human beings, and for that matter, across cultures, about how human beings express emotions. And one of the first people to really notice this and catalog it was Charles Darwin, who wrote a fascinating book, which I recommend to all of you, called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. And, and in this, he tried to taxonomize the basic emotions that all human beings express, regardless of culture. 
And it's kicked off a huge uh, scholarly literature that's still active today. And there's, there's, there's some good and interesting debates over exactly how to classify the emotions, where the lines are drawn, how much of it is cultural versus how much of it is biological. But most of those major debates are fairly marginal. The, 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 the heart of the, the field has been pretty well grounded. Uh, so for example, um, nearly all human beings across all cultures can recognize this face right here as happiness. Doesn't matter where they're grown up, doesn't matter where they're raised, what their, what their culture, what their religion, what their politics are, they see that face and they see that man as happy. And likewise, they see this face and recognize it as fear. It's something that's primal, it's something that's instinctive. Uh, we don't need to be uh, culturally trained or conditioned to it. We see that face and we understand that girl is scared. Uh, and likewise, we see this face here and recognize it as disgust. Uh, now, again, you, I, I could go on to give other examples, but I hope you see the point right here. But you, you look at these faces, and uh, 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 at least most neurotypical people will immediately recognize the emotions going on inside of them. Uh, that's something that we do automatically, and we do very, very simply. Uh, now, uh, precisely because we can understand these outward expressions of emotions, and then uh, uh, respond to them accordingly, this is what empowers our, that is, human beings, emotional intelligence. Uh, we can predict and understand our behavior, other behaviors, and, and what, our, what we're feeling, what other people are feeling because of this rational structure. Now, of course, we can try to hide our emotions from other people. And we do this using a very sophisticated technique that philosophers call lying. We tell them uh, that we're not actually feeling what we're feeling, and we try to explicitly transform our outward expressions to reflect what we want them to think that we are feeling rather than what we are actually feeling. Um, and the only reason we ever actually get away with lying is because most human beings are frankly not terribly perceptive. Uh, there are an, a, a small number of exceptions who are ridiculously good at this. And it is something actually that you can be trained to recognize even if you're not sort of naturally born with these capacities. Um, uh, uh, there, you actually can take courses. Uh, there's, there's, there's actually apps out there that will teach you to recognize what are called micro expressions. And uh, uh, in, their, in their sort of most elusive form, microexpressions are, are what happens with your facial muscles for literally fractions of a second before you regain your composure, put on a brave face, and then pretend to be feeling something other than what you're feeling. And the people who have this remarkable capacity to see these and, and track these uh, microexpressions can see even on trained actors when they're faking it. They know when an emotion is genuine, and they know when it is not. Um, now, as I say, these are, are fairly, uh, the, the human beings who can do this are fairly unique and, and very rare. Uh, machines that can do this, by contrast, though, are becoming more and more populous. Um, machines have much better perceptual capacities than human beings. Uh, they don't have to blink. Uh, they can record everything that they see and recall it with, uh, uh, with perfect accuracy. They, have, uh, they, can, they can have cameras that have much more refined uh, 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 ability to pay attention to detail than human eyes. Um, so, in short, computers are uh, uh, in a position where they can spot human emotions no matter how well you try to hide them. Those micro-expressions will, will, will betray what's going on in your heart no matter how much you want to convince the outside world that you're, you're not feeling what you're feeling. Now, at this particular point, relatively few computers are, are, are currently dedicated to that task. But that is in the process of changing. So by way of illustration, um, uh, I want you to consider how this technology is going to start changing our lives in unpredicted ways, un you know, uh, uh, unanticipated ways. Consider this little fella here. This is Vector. Uh, Vector is a commercially available robot. Uh, you can buy him for about $250 uh, 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 online or in any uh, computer electronics store. He's just hit the market a couple of months back. This is fairly cutting edge technology here. And as you can see on Vector, he has a little LED face. And that LED face can express a fairly wide range of emotions, which again, human beings recognize automatically. We use our emotional intelligence, and we can sort of see, yeah, that looks angry, you know, that looks furious, that looks scared. We recognize the same basic structures that we saw on the human faces on the, this little LED face. Um, and you know, the engineers who have made Vector have done, uh, done their research to make sure that these expressions are recognizable and transmutable. Um, so. Uh, another interesting thing about Vector is that he has a camera right in his forehead, and he can recognize individual human users that he interacts with. So if you have interacted with a particular Vector before, he will remember you, and he will remember how you treated him, 
and he will display an emotion accordingly. So if you have played with Vector before, he will be happy to see you. Where's, where's, where's Happy? Where's Happy? happy uh, glee. Maybe Glee. You guys, happy and Glee right there. So uh, you know, uh, uh, two levels. Uh, uh, if you've played with Vector, Vector's very excited. Vector is going to, 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 be, to be glad to see you because he'll recognize you as a friendly person. Uh, if you've neglected or ignored Vector, then he's more likely to, to, to sort of show uh, uh, anger, perhaps frustration. Uh, or maybe even boredom. Um, and, and he can do this with a fairly large number of distinct users uh, that he interacts with. Now, to be clear, obviously Vector doesn't feel anything. No one is of the uh, idea that there's any sort of internal phenomenological consciousness going on in Vector. Everyone recognizes that this is all simulation, uh, uh, no sort of deep reality going on there. Um, but Vector is also only the second generation of this particular robot. Uh, and while he is uh, uh, currently able to distinguish one face from another, he doesn't quite yet have the capacity to recognize different emotions on a single face. But that is a very simple technological hurdle to clear. It is a small step from the technology that al uh, allows us to distinguish Michel from Carol to distinguishing Carol upset from Carol happy. Uh, the, the, the basic technology is not terribly sophisticated. And with, uh, within a, a, a fairly small number of generations, I dare say, Vector and other progr computer programs like it will not only project uh, its own um, quasi-emotions out into the world, it will be reading and responding to the emotions that the users that it interacts with uh, uh, presents to them. And it's not doing this just for fun. It's doing this because knowing your emotions will allow it to manipulate and control you better. You pet Vector, and Vector gives you that face, you're going to want to pet Vector again. This is going to be an enticing and powerful set of emotional manipulation technologies that we are inviting into our homes. Now, um, it's uh, 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 not exactly news that human beings can become emotionally attached to inanimate objects. Most famously, probably, human beings get very attached to their cars. Uh, we, we, we have an emotional investment, and we often name them, uh, and, and we, we often might have certain emotional reactions if they, for example, get scratched or get bumped. Um, not everyone has this, of course, but uh, a surprisingly large number of people do get connected. But cars, of course, don't actually do anything. Left to their own devices, they will just sit there. Robots, by contrast, interact with us and, are, are, and hence are able to take advantage of this capacity of, for human beings to attach themselves to inanimate objects well because quite frankly they're not technically inanimate anymore. They are quite literally in the literal sense of the word animate. Uh, so one study for example found that some human beings were become emotionally attached to their Roombas. Now that might seem strange, uh, that might even seem funny, but I want to, 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 to recognize that there, there's beneath the humor of this um, there's something that's quite frankly terrifying. How long do you think it took iRobot, the company that manufactures Roombas, to try to figure out how to exploit this tendency to their advantage? Now, I have not seen any internal memos, but if this was published on March 2nd, I'm willing to bet on March 3rd there was an all-hands meeting in which they got together to try to figure out exactly what it is that they want to do with this piece of information. Others, another study found that uh, uh, human beings struggle to turn off a robot when it begs for its life. <laughs> Most people will at least hesitate. Some people will flat out refuse. It was a fairly simple instruction. They were asked to turn this robot off, and it gave some basic prompts in response to this. Uh, you know, it would say things like, I'm sorry, I want to make sure I get this right. Uh, it would say, no, please don't switch me off. Uh, another one it said was, I'm scared of the dart. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you feel that, right? I, I, can, I can sense it in the room. You guys would struggle with that too. Now, that seems cute. It's not. It is terrifying, okay? Because what, what, we, what we're teaching these machines how to do is to leverage us against our own interests and in favor of their own. Um, once Vector's descendants figure out how to stop you from switching them off, how much longer do you think it's going to be before they use that same skill set to nudge you into doing all sorts of things which you otherwise would not consent to. Now, maybe you're tempted to think that, well, 
I'm just not going to buy Vector, you know, or I'm not going to buy a Roomba, you know, uh, simple solution, right? Just uh, not invite any of these machines into my life. Well, um, you know, that's okay, good for you. Uh, but frank, frankly, it doesn't really matter. Uh, because in a fairly short period of time, this exact te same technology is going to migrate from a fairly niche aspect of the consumer electronic industry into much more mainstream areas of the economy. And commercially available devices, some of which you probably already own, some of which you probably have on you right now, will be empowered with this technology to scan your face and not just recognize who you are and recognize, oh, this is, this is a, an authorized user, unlock the phone. It will be able to read the emotions on your face, no, again, no matter how much you might try to hide them, and know very intimate details about what's going on inside of you, details that even the most attentive human beings are very likely to be blind to. In short, within a short period of time, your phone might have a better understanding of your emotional situation than your spouse does. And if that isn't a, a situation that makes you nervous, uh, let me try to sort of uh, uh, up the ante a little bit more. So, so again, some, some, more, some more technology here. IBM's uh, uh, artificial intelligence platform, Watson, uh, uh, has, some, has a pro program you can access on the web called Tone Analyzer. Uh, Tone Analyzer is a simple tool. Uh, you, know, you, you, can, you can Google it. You can, you can go there. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's something that has obvious commercial appeal. You, you take a piece of, of written information and you put it in, and it will tell you the emotional uh, a blueprint of the words that you've put down there. Uh, anyone who's ever tried to communicate with another human being through written text on the internet knows that it can be very hard to get across not just the literal meanings of the words, but the sense in which you mean those words to be conveyed. So this platform can help us better communicate with other human beings by telling us things that we might not notice about our written communications. So for example, uh, if your boss comes around and asks you to get those TPS reports back on his desk for the 18th time, you might decide that you're going you're gonna to pull up uh, uh, the, 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 your email and start typing something out to him, and you're going uh, to tell him, you know, get your own damn TPS reports. Um, uh, and then you might stop and think to yourself, wait a minute, maybe I should check this for tone to make sure this isn't the last email of my career. Uh, and, and the tone analyzer, you know, you, uh, once, you, once you get it typed up there, you hit analyze, it'll tell you, yeah, this looks angry. You know, the, uh, anger is, is what's coming across here. You probably don't want to send that email. Um, uh, it probably won't be terribly long until uh, Google and uh, any number of other platforms start instilling this as, as just sort of a default feature. In the same way that it has a grammar checker or a spell checker, it can have a tone checker in there to uh, hopefully facilitate better um, uh, uh, understanding of what people are thinking. Again, as, as, a, as an end user product, I admit that sounds appealing, but start thinking about how this technology could be used on a broad scale. Uh, this technology could be used in, for example, political campaigns. Uh, to try to sort of get the pulse of the people based on what they're tweeting. What are the people in this district feeling? And they can micro-target their message accordingly. Marketers can also micro-target, uh, not just to general areas, but to specific individuals based on what they're feeling. What words have you typed into Google's ecosystem today? That can tell Google what it is that you're feeling and then be more uh, able to, to, to uh, suggest products that you will be more uh, uh, amenable to. It's also possible to use this basic technology for voice recognition. Next time you talk to a bot over the phone, it might not just be trying to read your, the meanings of your words. It might be uh, attempting to understand what you are feeling behind those words and thus be able to tailor your artificially intelligent uh, um, uh, uh, receptionist uh, to your likings. Now again, you can see the commercial appeal, I hope, uh, but I also hope you can uh, see the dangers. Um, marketing is entirely about reading and manipulating human emotions. That's what it's there for. That's what it does. And it doesn't do it to improve the human condition. It doesn't do it to improve from human flourishing or to make the world a better place. It does it to generate revenue. And it does this by tapping, in, uh, by, by creating what the economist Kenneth Gal Galbraith referred to as artificial desires. Tapping into our fears and our insecurities and our anxieties many of which we don't even realize that we have, many of which we're not even fully conscious of, but which artificially, emotionally intelligent systems will be able to leverage against us in a remarkably efficient way. Even Vector is being marketed with an ironic nod to the fears that uh, AI often inspires. You know, uh, uh, His tagline here is Vector, the good robot. See how that works, right? You know, Vector's the good robot, not, not like this guy, no. This, guy, this is the bad robot. You don't, you don't want this robot. You want Vector. Vector's the good robot. Because Vector, smart enough to take over the world, but nice enough not to. <laughs> I got to say, I think that's a brilliant marketing campaign right there. I think that's, that's, that's very effective myself. But 
Heretofore, even in the, this age of, of digital media, most marketing has been fairly blunt force. Um, uh, it, it has been designed to, to capitalize on broad demographic trends, what people like you, broadly speaking, are interested in. Um, as we start turning to step up the, the use of artificial and emotional intelligence, this is going to become a lot more individualistic, a lot more pinpointed, and a lot more tailor-made. Um, once artificial intelligence has the capacity to pinpoint specific emotions that specific individuals are feeling at specific times, and to do so autonomously without any kind of human oversight, this is going to change the advertising game forever. One Facebook engineer recently lamented that the most brilliant minds of his generation are spending their days thinking about how to get people to click on ads. And he said, and punctuated that sentiment by saying, quote, that sucks. And I agree, that does suck. But I think he may have missed the principal reason why it sucks. Uh, the, the impression I got from his original quote is that it sucks that they're working on how to get people to click on ads instead of something better instead of something more constructive. And that is indeed something to lament. But it's also upsetting because these people are ridiculously good at what they do. All that brain power is incredibly effective at getting people to make the clicks. So as, this artificial, as these artificially intelligent emotional systems start to come online and become more ubiquitous, once this nut is cracked, we are going to find ourselves besieged by a multi-billion dollar industry that has the capacity to read our emotions with surgical precision, whose interests do you suppose that incredibly powerful tool will be engineered to serve? Here's a hint. It's not the people in this room. Imagine if YouTube or Facebook could read your face and tell how you're reacting to one of their ads that they're showing to you and adjust the ads that they show you accordingly. Think about how powerful and effective. What, imagine imagine what, what, what Siri is going to be like when Siri can read not just your words, but the mood and the tone that your words are being expressed in and tailor its responses to your queries accordingly. What kind of products might you buy because Amazon's Alexa delivers a suggestion in an emotionally pitch-perfect tone for the way you're feeling right at this moment? Now, all of these techniques are well beyond the proof, proof of concept space. None of this is speculative. All of this stuff actually exists. It's not widespread yet because there are some bottlenecks. But the, the two major bottlenecks that are preventing it from, from being widespread are really only a couple of things. First off, figuring out how to scale up this technology to, from the you know, labs in which you're dealing with a couple of dozen test subjects uh, to, to, to billions of end users using a variety of different uh, devices on dozens of different platforms and operating systems with vastly different computational capacities. This is a very, very hard thing to scale. And the second uh, uh, major bottleneck is simply figuring out precisely how to monetize this in the most effective way possible. You don't want to give away the game for free. You don't want to let the genie out of the bottle until you can figure out how to make money off that genie. But because there's so much money to be made, these two bottlenecks are not going to stand very long. They will fall down, um, and pretty soon this technology will be very, very pervasive, if not ubiquitous. Now, I suspect some of you might be thinking that you're too smart for all this. You're too cynical. You, know, you, you, you see all these ads, and you just blow right past them. You ignore them. They don't have an effect on you. Um, and if you're thinking that, well, let me just start by saying you're almost certainly wrong. Um, even the old blunt force methods of, of advertising are incredibly powerful, incredibly effective, even on people who think otherwise. People notoriously underestimate how much advertising can leverage their behavior. Even the most cynical people uh, uh, do respond to ads. Not all of them, of course, but that's part of the reason why you're so saturated by them, is because even if you're only responding to a small percentage, you're still responding to enough to make it worthwhile to invest billions and billions of dollars in this industry. There's a reason why you've never had to pay for Facebook or Google services, even though they are amongst the most profitable businesses in the history of the world. And that's because you are not their customer, you are their product. Now, even if you are, though, because some people, yeah, may, some people in this room may be smart enough to beat the algorithm, may be cynical enough to get around these kinds of emotional manipulations. It's possible. Uh, but even if you are, I can tell you, your children and your grandchildren will not be. Uh, and the reason for this is because uh, no matter how hard you try to inoculate your children and your grandchildren, um, your attention uh, is worth a lot to advertisers. Your attention uh, uh, is something that they're willing to invest some money to try to steal. They see you as a wallet. They see your children as a gold mine. 
Because they recognize that if they can get their hooks into children early, you can get customers for life. You can get brand loyalty. The amount of time you have left to spend on this earth, the amount of money you have left to spend on this earth is considerably less than the amount of money that your children will have to spend. So corporations are going to invest their resources to excavate and extract that value from your children proportionately. Your children are growing up in a world that has been meticulously designed, engineered, to make them trust machines. That is the real tragedy of what that Facebook engineer was talking about. The best minds of this generation are not merely working on getting you to click on advertisements. They're getting you to trust the algorithm. And they are incredibly, incredibly effective at doing that. This technology has applications far beyond marketing, OK? Um, let's talk about security for a moment, right? Uh, now, when you walked in here today, um, based on just my eyeball, naked eyeball calculation, depending on which door you entered and whether or not you came directly to this room or whether or not me, you meandered around, uh, you were observed by somewhere between six and a dozen separate security cameras. Uh, I actually asked them if they could tell me how many security cameras were on the ground floor, and, and they quite understandably wouldn't tell me. They, they don't want to give that information out. But you can notice them out there if you check. Uh, just, just go out there and take a look around and start to, to, to realize how surveilled we are in this, uh, in this building. Now, uh, to my knowledge, Sac State has not invested in a sophisticated artificial emotional intelligence suite of softwares. I don't think that there, such a platform is quite yet commercially available across the board. But in a fairly short period of time, it will be an option. And should Sac State choose to invest in such a, uh, an artificially emotionally intelligent security platform, those cameras can tell them a lot more than just being a post hoc record of who was here and who wasn't. The cameras will be able to track individuals as they move across campus. They will be able to tell things about them, for example, who is tired and who is well rested. And perhaps most importantly for security purposes, uh, it will be able to tell uh, 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 people whether or not someone is intent on harming another human being. The facial expressions that a person engages in when they are preparing themselves for violence are distinctive and easily trackable. So with the epidemic of things like school shootings, you can understand why universities, and for that matter, high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools, are going to want to have advanced warning if someone walking onto their campus has malicious intent in their heart. These machines will be able to tell them that, which will allow for early intervention and will no doubt save many lives in the future. Good thing, no doubt. Another good thing, think about airports. Not just, it's not just schools, it's airports that can use this technology. Imagine how awesome it will be when one day, hopefully near in the future, you will be able to walk into an airport and you won't have to stand in a security line at TSA. You will be able to walk from the front entrance of the airport right up to your gate, no scanning necessary, because the TSA will be able to parse out based on your body language, your facial expression, based on your gait, the basic science of gate analysis can tell you a tremendous amount about what a person is thinking and what they're feeling. And that way you can distinguish who's the terrorist from who's just the aggravated person who just wants to get on their plane. Now, this may sound like science fiction, but again, I want to underscore it's not. This technology is being implemented in certain places. So uh, there's a Chinese company called Cloudwalk Technologies that's currently using software like this, slightly more rudimentary, not quite as sophisticated as I'm portraying here. Uh, but again, this is ramping up fast. Cloudwalk, Te Cloudwalk Technologies has paired with the Chinese government and is starting to issue every Chinese citizen a quote unquote social credit score. And this score can be uh, it's currently based principally on past social behavior. You have a criminal record, for example. It's also based on reports that other citizens will, will inform the government about you. But it's also starting to be switch over to artificial intelligence systems. Uh, they, in the reasonably near future, CloudRock technologies will be able to tell what the individual citizens of China are thinking and feeling and adjust their social credit score accordingly. Um, now, don't be reassured to think that this is happening only in China. For one thing, there actually is some uh, records suggesting that Chinese government actually is tracking American citizens and citizens of other countries, too, and building databases on all of them. They are very serious about uh, this technology. But moreover, uh, again, I, I, I'm going to predict that all sorts of other governments are going to do this, too. Because honestly, in the same way that we want to know about whether or not someone who just walked onto this campus is a school shooter, what government isn't going to want to know which of their citizens are having antisocial emotions? Which of them are maybe considering committing a violent crime? Which of them are maybe considering trying to overthrow the government? 
the, the, the appeal of this technology, the temptation to employ it in spite of any sort of uh, uh, civil liberties or civil rights concerns, are simply, quite frankly, it's going to be too powerful for governments to resist. And in a relatively short period of time, I suspect most countries are going to follow suit to what China is doing. Now, speaking of governments, the military applications for this technology are also worth thinking about. Uh, winning hearts and minds has been a very popular slogan uh, since at least the Vietnam War. But it hasn't been a terribly effective strategy. And that's in large part because human beings are not very good at winning uh, uh, hearts and minds, especially when you're talking uh, uh, across cultural differences. Imagine how much more effective militaries, militaries will be able to be at prosecuting this kind of strategy once you can employ real-time analytics that tell them precisely how a target population is feeling, what sorts of emotions that they're having in reaction to troop presence, in reaction to local propaganda, in reaction to uh, various militant factions. Uh, you, you can have this unfold on an hour by hour basis and adjust your propaganda, fine tune it for a specific theater of operations uh, uh, as events unfold. Uh, we will be much more, much better at this than we have been in, in past decades. But of course, competing factions won't just sit by while enemy AIs seduce their comrades over to the other side. You can expect a new arms race in artificial emotional intelligence, arm wrestling for control over the hearts and minds of the population. Now, richer nations obviously will have a certain advantage. They're going to have more resources. They're going to have access to the technology first. But poorer nations are going to have home court advantage. They're going to have higher cultural literacy and quite possibly decades, if not centuries, of local distrust of outside nations working in their favor. And it won't simply be on foreign battlefields that such emotional proxy wars will be waged. Governments don't nearly need to sway hearts and minds of people in lands they occupy. They need to control the hearts and minds of the people at home as well, on the home front, in order to be effectively wage the wars that they want to wage. Governments have long used tools of mass persuasion pioneered by public relations and advertising industry to sell their wars to the people. There's every reason to think that they're going to continue to do this going forward. So what is to be done about this, right? Uh, uh, I imagine at this stage, I've, I've, I'm hoping I've leveraged you with a, a fair amount of some pretty scary uh, prospects. And you're probably hoping uh, that I'm going to be able to, to offer some sort of strategies, some sort of ways of, of, uh, of, of resisting and fighting back, something that will uh, allow us to pool our resources and with some combination of personal grit, cultural renewal, and legislative oversight, pull ourselves back from the brink of this artificial emotional intelligence doomsday. And if you're thinking that, you've clearly forgotten the first two points, the second and third points that I opened up this talk with. Um, I wasn't joking when I said that they're coming for your children and you should run for your lives. It's, it's a little bit of hyperbole, but the basic point holds. I wish I could tell you that there was some 12-step uh, program we could take to, to, to combat this technology, uh, but quite frankly, there aren't. Uh, the political and the financial incentives are simply too strong. To, they create an inertia that's too powerful to resist. Make no mistake about it, this technology is coming. Uh, and it's coming very, very quickly. Uh, now, no doubt, the brief sketch that I've outlined here is going to get some of the details wrong. I, again, I'm not claiming to have a crystal ball. I don't know exactly how this stuff is going to play out. But, I'm, but I am confident that the broad strokes will be more or less in line with what we're talking about here. So while I have no easy solutions, I do have some good news. Um, I began this talk by talking about how emotions have a structure. And I've been doing my best to deliberately tap into your fear. Because much like advertisers know, fear is a route to your attention. And I've wanted to capture your attention. But there's another way to capture your attention. And that's fear's close cousin, hope. So I want to close off my talk by giving you guys some reasons to hope. So the perils of artificial emotional intelligence are clear. But the promise has a lot of value too. Now, Orwellian fears about loss of privacy, and, uh, and they should not be marginalized. Obviously, I've been putting them front and center in this talk. But I do think it's important to place them in their proper context, because that's not the only thing that's going to happen as a result of this technology. In spite of the dangers and in spite of the costs that I put, uh, I've been sort of sketching here, there are tremendous benefits of this technology as well. And we should take them seriously. The world that I have been describing above is a world with far less antisocial violence than the world that we currently experience. It's a world in which depressed and lonely and isolated people will have greater access to humans and technology that can help them in powerful and effective ways. This will save countless marriages. It will prevent suicides and school shootings. It will help people cope with the death of loved ones. 
and will connect them with human beings and possibly even other machines who share their passions and interests. And that will deeply enrich the lives of these human beings. This is a world where wars can be effectively averted before they even begin due to the aid of artificial, emotionally intelligent diplomats. Again, this is happening. This is this year right here. This, uh, this assembly was uh, brought together precisely to try to sort of anticipate where this is going and how it will affect diplomacy, international relations. Now, this isn't some cold comfort silver lining. Oh, at least there's, there's, there's this tiny upside. This is it. We're talking here about a massive increase in the total overall amount of human happiness on this planet. Um, on nearly every measure. Now, this will not be unambiguously good for us, but nor will it be unambiguously bad for us either. There's going to be tremendous amount of good that comes from this technology. And moreover, the evils that I have been talking about probably won't be quite as bad as I have been uh, uh, letting them out to be. I've been deliberately trying to play something of a doomsayer here. Now, I do that because I think doomsayers have an important role to play in society. Uh, they draw our attention to things which we might not otherwise notice. Uh, but at the same time, doomsayers don't necessarily make the best prognosticators. So to understand why that, let's go back again to ancient Greece. Go back to the, the, the myth of Pandora's box really quickly. Now, Pandora, uh, if you don't know your ancient Greek, Pandora's name literally translates to the girl with all the gifts. Pandora was an artificial being that was created by Zeus to usher in the destruction of humanity for our crime of stealing fire from the gods. Now, this has been a parable about the dangers of technology for 2,500 years. But we're all still here. Okay? Socrates, uh, quite famously, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, so here's, here's Pandora unleashing uh, death and disease uh, 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 out of her box onto the world. Um, now, Socrates uh, famously had concerns about technology. Uh, he warned that the invention of written language would corrupt the minds of men by eliminating their capacity to remember things. Uh, followers of the mythic Ned Ludd in 19th century England would literally smash industrial machines because they were afraid that they were stealing jobs from the working class. And this gave birth to the term Luddite to refer to a person who opposes technological change. Uh, just about 20 years ago, one of the most famous Luddites, Ted Kaczynski, you probably know him as the Unabomber, killed three people and injured 23 more in acts of domestic terrorism motivated by his fear that technology was a threat to human dignity and freedom. Now, all of these voices had legitimate concerns. Uh, they brought our attention to things which we should pay attention to. But at the same time, of course, all these worst case scenarios that we're talking about never came to pass. The written word has not destroyed our capacity to remember things. To the contrary, it has greatly assisted our ability to more accurately record the past. The Industrial Revolution did not lead to mass unemployment. To the contrary, it led to the greatest and most productive harnessing of human labor the planet has ever seen. And 21st century technology has not undercut human freedom. To the contrary, according to multiple independent human freedom indices, more human beings and a greater percentage of human beings on the planet have a higher degree of freedom now than any other time in human history. And that's not exclusively due to technology, but it is in part due to technology. All of these technophobes have been wrong. So this track record, I think, should give us a good reason to be skeptical that artificial intelligence, either of the classical variety or the artificial emotional intelligence variety that I've been focusing on, is going to usher in an unprecedented era of human misery. But I do think we have to be cognizant of the fact that much of this is going to be outside of our control. Um, we probably will not be able to stop these machines from reading our emotions. We probably will not be able to stop them from manipulating our emotions. This might just be a fact that we have to learn to deal with but counterintuitively, I think we can take comfort in that. There is something to be said for the value of recognizing when you are not in control. Various philosophical traditions, uh, uh, the, the, the Stoics in ancient Rome, uh, the, the Buddhists in uh, uh, India and Japan, and the existentialists of 20th century Europe have all sort of concluded that the wisest attitude to take towards life is to focus on the things that you can control and let everything else slide. Or as one modern philosopher put the point, sometimes we just need to let it go. <laughs> now, being out of control is nothing new for us. Uh, human beings have precious little control over so much 
of our lives. We don't control the weather. We don't control other human beings. We have very little control over our own emotions, for that matter. Um, but we've somehow managed to come to terms with this and accept that this is part of the human condition. And if we can do that, then I think that, that uh, uh, heralds the prospect that we might be able to recognize that much like the endless march of time, it is OK to surrender control. So the fact that we have little control, though, doesn't mean that we have no control. We have some control. One of the things that uh, the Stoics, the Buddhists, and the existentialists all noted was that one of the things that we can control is how we react to the things that we can't control. Maybe we will choose to reject this technology, to be bitter about it, to, to let it twist us into paranoid, lonely, isolated creatures like, like Ted Kaczynski. But we have another option. We can reject the myth of Pandora's box. We can reject the idea that uh, hope is a gift that's given to us. That's how the story ends, you'll recall. When Pandora's box is open, she slams it shut, and the only thing that's left inside is hope. But hope doesn't have to be seen that way. Hope can be seen as a choice. It is something that we do have control over. Hope is not a gift from the gods, either of the mountain or of the valley, as it were. Hope is a choice. It's something we bestow on ourselves. So even if artificial emotional intelligence, like most of life, ends up being outside of our control, it will just as likely not immiserate us. There, are, there is reason to hope here in spite of the very real dangers I hope I've drawn your attention to. So do not despair. Pandora cannot steal your hope unless you let her. And even if she does, you can always make more. If there's one thing that we can control, it's that. Thank you very much.